Good morning. Um, thank you, Nate. As Nate said, I am a member of the teaching team. I'm also um, rolling off of the elder board in a few couple of weeks, and we have an amazing slate of elders to vote in on Thursday, so please do attend that meeting. I'm really excited for what's to come. So um, I'm going to start off today the way I always do, with a story. But before I start, I'd like to pray. Holy Father, we just thank you for this passage. It is a short passage, a short story, but it, is, it has so much packed in it. Lord, you've used this, this passage to transform our, our lead pastor. And I just ask that you speak through your words today to transform each one of us and to touch us uniquely where we need to be touched with each little nugget that you have um, just packed into this passage. We thank you for your love and for your grace. We just ask, invite you in today. We pray in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. So I attended a, a large university with a huge campus. It was around five, you know, 5,500 acres. And the only way to get to class on time between classes was to ride a bike. So on any given day, there were about 22 to 25,000 bikes on campus. Maybe you went to a campus that was similar. And when I was a freshman and I was preparing to go, I decided I knew which bike I wanted to take. I wanted to take my, my 10 speed. Now my father had said to me, I think you should take your old rusty three speed. I think you should take your, your three speed. I rode that bike over the roots and rocks of wooded upstate New York every summer. The thing was indestructible. It was like a tank. It was like built like a tank. That's not the bike I wanted to take. That's the closest picture I could get to my, my trusty steed. I wanted to take my Schwinn 10 speed because I thought that I would not look like a freshman if I was riding my 10 speed with my arms folded across my, my front, with my backpack on my back, nonchalantly going, I'm not a freshman, I'm cool. The Huffy 3 speed was not going to give off the vibe that I was cool. And I thought the 3 speed would say, I am a freshman, but the 10 speed would say, I'm not a freshman. So I took my 10 speed to, to school against better advice. But for the first couple of weeks, I was living in California, so there's no rain, right? So for the first couple of weeks, I thought, I made the right choice. I look great. Until the first day it rained. You see, I got to my chem class that morning and discovered immediately that I had a problem. I had a stripe of water, mud, and gravel all the way up my back and into my hair. And as I slithered into the room and sat in my chair, I thought, oh, I hope nobody can see this. I had what I soon discovered was called, anyone? The freshman stripe. <laughs> it was actually a thing. So as I rode back to, to my dorm that day and I looked around, I noticed that there were three speeds on campus, there were 10 speeds, there were cruisers, there were bikes that had big baskets with flowers on them, there were bikes that had banana seats. Nobody cared about the bike that they had. What did they all have? They all had fenders. To not have a fender was to tell the world, I am a freshman. I took my bike back home the next time I went home for the weekend and I switched it out for my, my three-speed. And my dad didn't say, I told you so. He didn't say, I knew taking that 10-speed was a big mistake. He didn't even ask me why I was switching out the bikes. He did not make me retell my story of humiliation. The only thing he said was, I knew you'd make the right choice. Now that was 35 years ago, okay? I don't remember that story because of what bike I ultimately rode around campus. I remember that story because of that moment of grace. Because even in the most ridiculous and seemingly insignificant moments, grace is powerful. And I'll never forget it. We are in the third week and the final week of a series called Reset. We've been resetting our understanding of grace. 
Two weeks ago, Mike took us through the parable of the workers in the vineyard, where he taught about the lavishness of God's grace, how generously he extends it to us, and that when we are ready to accept it, he will welcome us into his kingdom with grace, even if some of us do choose to enter at the very last minute. He has enough grace for that. And then last week, he taught on the cost of God's grace, how it's free to us, but it is so very costly to him. And this week, we are going to talk about having the grace to serve. What it means when we understand grace and we allow God's grace to flow through us and out to others in a way that allows us to serve. So to do that, we're going to start with kind of a funny story in the Bible. I think it's funny because it has a meddling mother. I wouldn't know anything about that. But here's how it kicks off. We, find this, we pick up the story in Matthew chapter 20, verse 20. Then the mother of the sons of Zebedee came to Jesus with her sons, bowing down and making a request of him. And he said to her, what do you wish? as if he didn't know. She said to him, command that in your kingdom, these two sons of mine may sit, one on your right and one on your left. Boom, (laughs) like the drama unfolds almost immediately. The mother of these two disciples wants to ensure her son's rightful place in in Jesus' kingdom. And she doesn't really politely ask about the possibility. It, It comes across to me as almost like a demand. She's demanding that he command that her son sit at his right and left side when Jesus comes into his kingdom. And the sons don't really argue, right? They don't, we don't see them saying, Mom, you're embarrassing us right now. That's not how it works. As the story unfolds, we'll see that their silence is deafening. And you may be thinking, well, you're not really being fair, right? I mean, this is their mother speaking on their behalf. You're reading too much into the story. Let's not assume they also wanted this. But the thing is, if we look at the context, if we go to a couple chapters back in Matthew 18, we see that these disciples are constantly fighting over who's, who's the greatest in the kingdom, right? And in a, in, in a couple of weeks, a couple of chapters, maybe days, I can't remember the timeline, we're going to find that at the last supper that these disciples had with Jesus, after he served them by washing their feet, right before he got arrested, they still start quibbling again over who is the greatest and who is going to be the greatest in his kingdom. So this issue is very top of mind for them. The two brothers just happened to have a mother to push the issue on their behalf. Lucky boys. And maybe the mother is the one who blunders with Jesus, but as the the story progresses, we'll see that none of them just really get it. And we have the benefit of knowing how Jesus' life unfolds from here. And we have the benefit of seeing the stories of how Jesus' death and resurrection ultimately transforms these disciples. But at this point, they don't have that benefit. But what they do have the benefit of is three years of walking with Jesus, of having been taught by him, of having watched him humbly serve people. And here they are, quibbling over, Which one of them is the greatest, caught up in their own pride and blinded by their own ambition? Personal ambition just doesn't allow a lot of room for God or others. Personal ambition can be all-consuming. It puts us in competition with others. If you have a leg up, I must be a leg down. If I help you succeed, I must somehow be less than. We treat life like a zero, a zero sum game. I can't think of too many things more mutually exclusive than personal ambition and care and concern for others. And you may be thinking, well, I don't know if I agree with that because ambition is, can't always be a bad thing. I mean, the ambition to do well at whatever endeavor I choose to do, that can't be a bad thing. Maybe you have an ambition to serve others well. But that's not really ambition, because most of the definitions of ambition link it almost always to the strong desire to achieve, particularly in the pursuit of rank, fame, or power. It's about status. It's all about me, my rank, my fame, and my power. And that's where we find the disciples. That's the kind of ambition that smothers 
grace. As our personal ambitions grow, they crowd out our love for Jesus, which crowds out his compassion for others. And that little word grace can scarcely be found. It's easy to forget that we need grace, and if we don't even remember that we need grace, we're hardly thinking about whether or not others need grace. It's like the pathways to receiving and extending grace are blocked, and ambition is the juggernaut. Now, I know in my 20s, Nate, <laughs> when I was young, um, ambition was a big deal for me, right? You get out of college, and you get your first job, and trying to get up the corporate ladder, and I was chasing after the status, and the titles were coming, and I was a shell of myself. Because I had been a Christian pretty much my whole life, and so there was a really serious spiritual dissonance in my life when I claimed to know Jesus Christ and yet did not live a life of service. I certainly wasn't, I wasn't making a lot of time for Jesus, but my ambitions were taking up all my time and wasn't even going to church on Sundays sometimes for long stretches. If you had asked me to, to define the word grace, I probably wouldn't even know where to start. That's how far I had, I had strayed. Are you experiencing any of that dissonance in your life? Like, what do these circles look like for you? What are you trying to achieve? And more importantly, why are you trying to achieve it? What is your ambition crowding out? Now, some of you may be thinking, well, I don't really struggle with this. This is not a struggle for me. And some of you may be thinking, well, this actually is a struggle for me, right? Because in what Mike has been calling our, our upside-down world for a couple of weeks, personal, in, in our upside-down world, personal status as defined by wealth and titles can mean a lot. But we'll see that in God's right-side-up kingdom, they mean nothing. Maybe you've already achieved what you've been chasing after, and somehow that achievement still feels a bit empty. And you're starting to realize it. Maybe God is starting to tr align your heart with his, and there's a dissonance going on in there because you're fighting him. Now, we see the same thing with the allure of authority. To ask to sit at Jesus' right and left hand is about status, but it's also about power, right? The disciples are looking for authority, a position that they have not actually earned. They want to be included in the president's cabinet. They want to be included at the president's table. They want to be at the right and left hand of the president. They want the president's ear. They want to have influence. But on what grounds? Like, on what grounds do they deserve the positions that they seek? So it takes a lot of energy to achieve positions of power, and it takes a lot of energy to keep them. It takes a lot of energy to keep them, particularly when, the pe when you've, you've, you haven't really earned the position of power, and people that you're lording it over are bucking you at every turn. It's all-consuming. It takes up time. It takes up energy. There is no room to serve others. And it crowds out grace. Now Jesus knows the disciples' thoughts and their motivations. And here's how he responds. But Jesus called them to himself and he said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great men exercise authority over them. It is not this way among you. Well, it kind of is, but it's not supposed to be this way among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you shall be your slave. Where have we heard these words before? Two weeks ago, in the parable of the workers in the vineyard, when Jesus described his right-side-up kingdom to people living in this upside-down world, when he said, so the last will be first, and the first will be last. It didn't make sense to the disciples then, and it doesn't make sense to the disciples now. Jesus is telling them a true leader isn't looking for power. A true leader is looking to serve. The greatest leaders are not concerned about their authority. They're concerned about the needs of others. But that's not where the disciples' heads are right now. It's all about me and my power over you is where, they're think where they are. And just like the drive of ambition, the allure of authority is crowding out their understanding of God's heart 
and their experience of God's grace. I think there's so much irony here. The disciples are walking and talking with Jesus, whom Paul tells us in Philippians 2 is in his very nature God, but who chose to take the form of a servant. He chose to take the form of a servant. And they're quibbling over who gets to be in, the, in a position of authority as his right-hand man. They are clamoring to be the right-hand man of a servant. And they don't even realize it. That quibbling brings us to a moment that must have frustrated Jesus as much as it broke his heart. They begin fighting. There's no unity among them. And hearing this, the ten became indignant with the two brothers. The ten other, uh, ten other disciples are now concerned. What if Jesus grants this request? I mean, surely these two are not the greatest among us. I can imagine the twelve turned internally in a huddle, angrily working out the pecking order of their little group while Jesus looks over them at the helpless and harassed people of the world he came to save. Our individual ambitions diminish our ability to serve others, but collectively, our collective lack of unity because of our personal ambitions diminishes our ability to serve the world together. It's like an individual spiritual disease that strikes our hearts but sickens the ministry of the entire church. But here's the thing. Jesus, in his grace, is incredibly patient with the disciples because this has been a recurring theme. I mean, how many times with kids? You're like, how many times have I told you? Like, we're going on three, four times here. I don't even know, right? He has seen them argue over their pecking order before. He has taught them the words, the first shall be last and the last shall be first before. He has modeled a life of humble service for them for a long time. But when they don't get it, still, he doesn't blast them. <clears throat> he challenges them. He loves them enough to challenge them. You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I am about to drink? And they said to him, we are able. Now when Jesus says, you don't know what you're asking. That's kind of a loaded statement, right? Like, it's a, it's a loaded statement enough that they should stop and pause, but they don't even stop and pause. They don't say, why did he say that we don't know what we're asking? Um, Jesus, what do you think that we think that we're asking? Like, what are we asking? They, when Jesus says, are you able to drink the cup that I'm about to drink? They don't stop and think, so remind us again, <laughs> like, what's the cup? The cup that Jesus is about to drink, as described in Isaiah 51, is the cup of God's wrath. God is going to pour his wrath out for the sins of humanity, our anger, our jealousy, our pride, our selfishness, every rebellious thought, ambition, and action that has driven a wedge between us and him. And when God pours out that cup, Jesus is going to drink it. He's going to be arrested, tried, and executed, and through that process, he's going to experience the fury of God's wrath. It's the wrath that should be reserved for us. But Jesus is going to take it. He's been warning his disciples about this, but they don't stop and think about what he's been teaching long enough to make the connection. So when he asks if they can drink the cup, they say, we can. Of course we can. Okay then, let me remind you. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. The whole point, guys, is that you can't. You cannot handle the cup that I am about 
to drink. That is why I've come to drink it. I'm about to pay a ransom to set you free from the bondage and consequences of sin, to rescue you from the wrath of God. And I, the king of the right side up kingdom, am going to pay the ransom for this upside down world with my life. Now, the disciples would have known about ransom, a sum of money paid for the rescue of a captive. I read that captivity back then was considered a punishment worse than death. So ransoming Jewish captives was important to Jewish communities. But there were laws governing ransom. And depending on a person's crimes or transgressions, he or or she may not be worthy of being ransomed the community would decide, is this guy worth ransoming? And the answer could be, yeah, nah, nah. And then over the centuries, in times of war, right, different ransoms would be levied for various captives of various ranks, with the highest value captives receiving the highest ransoms. We saw this a lot with medieval kings. The very highest ransoms were paid for the release of a captive king. Never for the lowly masses. Never for the guy, the lowest guy on the, on the totem pole. And yet Jesus was planning to pay the ransom for the disciples, for all of humanity, even the least among us. He is the king who came to be our humble servant. So again, there's so much irony here. The disciples are quibbling over who gets to be the right-hand man of Jesus as Jesus prepares to pay their ransom, as Jesus prepares to pay the price that will allow their entrance into the right-side-up kingdom. Without his sacrifice, they don't even get in. Never mind sit at his right and left hand. They don't understand how desperately they need God's grace yet. And they don't understand how transformed they will be once they've experienced it and understand it. So this is where things get really tricky for us because some of us really know that we need God's grace because we know that we kind of blow it like daily, hourly, minute by minute. But some of us might be like, you know what? Like life is good. Like I like the level at which I'm living my life and I kind of like that I've achieved what I've achieved. And people respect me. Like when I speak, people listen. Things are pretty good. I feel like I'm in control. And I'm just not really sure. Like why do I need God's grace? I think about this a lot. And you know, some of us in the church, we talk about this a lot because we live in a part of the country where people are educated and and, and there's a lot of wealth. And and sometimes we just forget or we just don't understand how much we need God's grace. I was at a conference once, um, and one of the speakers was Kim Alexis. If you're my age, you might recognize that name. Back in the 70s and 80s, she was a cover model. She was on the cover of like 500 magazines. And I was at a Christian conference, and she was one of the speakers. And she spoke about her, just her life. I mean, she lived a life and all, with all the excesses of like a New York City supermodel kind of a life. Um, She had everything she needed. She had everything she wanted, or so she thought. She had two kids, and uh, they hired a nanny. I think they were still living in New York. And this nanny was a Christian. As nanny came into the house and was always playing Christian music and would kind of share the love of Jesus with her, and, you know, over time, she found, you know, she was living the life, and her nanny, by upside-down world kind of standards, had, had very little, had nothing, But this nanny had the riches of the right side up kingdom. And this nanny walked through the house with love and joy and peace. And there was something in her, and there's something that radiated out of her that made Kim jealous. She was jealous for what her nanny had and eventually allowed her nanny to share Christ with her. And she's a Christian now. She discovered that Despite all that she had, the status and the money and the wealth and power, I'm guessing, it always comes with money, it seems, there was something missing, and that was God's grace. 
When I think about that nanny, I think about all the humble servants that God has around the world who are doing his work in unseen places. And I wonder about the places that he has prepared for them in his kingdom. See, Jesus said to the disciples, you will indeed drink from my cup, but to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they've been prepared by my Father. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, did eventually drink from the cup. Now, it wasn't the cups of, cup of God's wrath, the way Jesus drank from the cup of God's wrath, but it was from the cup of suffering, the kind of suffering that comes from sh- serving God and spreading the gospel. Because after Jesus' death and resurrection, they finally understood who he was, like really understood who he was and why they needed him. They understood why he came, and they understood his grace. And when they received that grace, it did transform them to serve. And Pastor Mike always talks about this ragtag group. We are here today because of their service. That is the power of God's grace working through their lives. Now, at the start of today, we looked at some circles that were a little out of whack. You know, we looked at the circle of ambition and how it was crowding out the love of Jesus and crowding out compassion and kind of crowding out grace. Same thing with authority. But they weren't just out of whack in terms of their size. They were also out of whack in terms of their order. Because really, Jesus is at the very heart. He is at the heart of grace. He is at the heart of God's love and compassion. He is at the heart of humility. He represents it all. And without him, like, we can't experience any of the other three. When we ask him to come into our lives, he brings those things with him. Without them flowing into and out of us, we will just never experience God's grace to serve. We'll never quite be at peace in this upside-down world, but we also won't quite feel like we're at place in his right-side-up kingdom. God's grace works in and through us best when we allow ourselves to be conduits both receiving his grace and giving it away. And it just doesn't work well when that conduit is blocked. Now, I noticed this long ago with a roommate who um, professed to be a Christian, and we went to church together, but she had a really hard time extending grace, so much so that I I was always walking on eggshells around her because I just didn't know, am I going to say the wrong thing? Am I going to do the wrong thing? There was a lot of anger And I just found that so, like, I was trying to figure out, like, how can you be so angry all the time and be a Christian? Because being a Christian comes with understanding God's grace. Like, I just, I, I couldn't understand it. And then one day, like, it clicked. She was as hard on herself as she was on others. And I thought, she doesn't understand grace. Like, she hasn't truly experienced grace. It's not coming into her so that it can flow out to others. There's a blockage somewhere. And in this story, we've been talking about the blockage of ambition or the blockage of power, but there's so many things that can block our understanding and our experience with God's grace. So as you think about your own ambitions, your own relationship with Jesus, how you see humility and compassion playing out in your life, think for a moment about what in your life could be blocking your experience of God's grace, your ability to receive it, and your ability to extend it. Have you experienced God's grace in your life? While you think about that, I'm going to share a little chart with you. I think about this chart. I mean, this roommate was like 40 years ago. And this chart has been in my brain ever since. And so now I get to share it with you. It's this idea that on the bottom, our ability or willingness to give grace. And on the, going up the, up the side, our ability and, willi- and willingness to accept grace. Like, there's this relationship between our ability to accept grace and our ability to receive grace. And there's these little quadrants that I see people 
stationed in. Sometimes I see myself moving around the little quadrants, and I'm always hoping to be in the one in the top right, and I'll walk you through them. If you want to take a picture of it, you can. I know there's a lot of words on this page. <coughs> but when we have, I, I think about my roommate and how she struggled. She was like emotionally and relationally frozen. She had a low ability to accept grace and a low ability to give grace. And, and, and I just, and she was, she struggled to serve people. She struggled to love people. It's like you're spiritually frozen in that space. Or maybe you go up and you're like, hey, I love receiving grace, but I struggle to give it. Do people in your life feel like maybe you're a, a taker? That's kind of a harsh word to use. I couldn't come up with another one. But you're always like, I want the grace, but I'm having a hard time giving it. And how does that impact your relationships? Or down here, you may be somebody who's constantly pouring out grace, but you really struggle to receive it. And do you ever find yourself feeling bitter or used or exhausted emotionally and spiritually? Like, I'm just all poured out, and there's just nothing coming in? Because we're, if we are really conduits of God's grace, if we have said, Lord, I get that I need grace, and I accept your grace, and it is flowing through me, and I am so overwhelmed by that grace that it is just passing out to the people it, it, around me. And you might be in that top right quadrant where you have the grace to serve as an open vessel, accepting God's grace and allowing it to flow through to others. Where are you right now? We cannot give what we do not have. We cannot give God's love if we don't have God's love. We cannot give God's grace if we don't have God's grace or we're not experiencing God's grace. And we cannot receive God's grace if we don't believe that we need God's grace. So where are you in that? If you fall in any of the quadrants other than the top right, just pray and be like, Lord, what in my life is blocking the pathways to grace? What is keeping me from fully understanding and experiencing your grace? And what is keeping me from serving others motivated by your grace? If you want to talk about this, there's going to be people. I'll be up here. There will be people up here to pray with you. Or um, you can always go out and ask at the hub. And just say, I'd like to start a journey where I start understanding more fully what it means to live in God's grace. So I'm going to leave you with this story. It's sort of in insignificant, kind of like my story about the bike. This one also, funnily, involves a bike. There's like a bike theme today. But I want to share it with you because I want you to understand that understanding, experiencing, and learning to extend gr God's grace to others, A, is a lifelong journey, but B, happens in the day-to-day. -day. Insignificant moments. They can be hugely significant. They can be day-to-day. -day. I was driving home one day. My kids were really young. They were like five and three. And it was the end of a long day. It was one of those days if you've, if you've had little kids in the car for a long day, you know I, I'd probably had them in and out of their car seats like one too many times. We needed to get home. We were tired. We were hungry. And I was like, work, I was like driving on borrowed time. I needed to get home. So we stop at a light, and I see out of the corner of my eye, there's a frail elderly gentleman struggling with a bike and a 25-pound bag of kitty litter. He was trying to ride his bike and carry the kitty litter, and it was not happening. It was, the bike kept falling, and he was just falling over it, and it was, yeah. And I thought, it would be really nice if somebody helped him. <laughs> and then I thought, okay, you need to help him. And I was like, oh, no, I've got two young, young kids in the car. We are tired, we are hungry, and we are going home. He needs to get home, too. Okay, that's when my judgment came in because I was going to, I was like, if I can judge this man, I can justify not helping him. So I thought, okay, look, he knew what he was doing when he bought that bag of kitty litter. Like, surely he knew there was no way he was getting that bag of kitty litter home on his bike. There, justified. I wasn't feeling good about myself, but I was justified. I did not need to help him. And then God was like, okay, now I'm going to play hardball. So I looked to my left, and there was a car to my left that was like three or four people in it. They had seen the man too, 
and they were pointing at him, and they were mocking him. And I was like, oh, no. That's what it took to, like, rip me out of my selfish, ambi- like, my selfish mindset. I was like, oh, no, I'm not having that. Okay, we can't have that. So I whipped the car out of the lane and quickly into the <laughs> parking lot. My oldest was like, what are you doing? And I was like, we're going to help that man. And he was like, how? And I was like, I have no idea. Because I wasn't going to invite a strange man into my car, and I couldn't fit his bike into his, my car, and I was like, I can fit the kitty litter into my car. <laughs> so I walked up to him and I asked him if I could drive his kitty litter home. <laughs> he told me where he lived, and I put the kitty litter in the front seat, and the light that I had been at turned green, and as I looked up, I saw the car that had been mocking him start to go. They were still watching. They were still mocking. This time, they were mocking both of us. <laughs> I'm like, what is that crazy lady doing? I was like, fine. So I drove his kitty litter home, and when we met up in the parking lot, he was so relieved because he had a cat, and he needed kitty litter, and he didn't have a car. And he thought he could make it work with his bike, and he couldn't. Now, the whole time I was driving to his apartment complex, I was thinking, I got to tell this guy that Jesus made me do this. <laughs> and so I was like, God loves you. Jesus loves you. What am I going to say? It was a very quick interaction. I said something like, Jesus loves you or God loves you or something, and I got in my car and went home. And I don't even know if it was about the message I gave him as much as it was a test for me. Like, in a moment that is just not of my choosing, Am I going to notice somebody in need and stop and help? And just humbly serve when it's just not convenient for me? Was I going to allow Christ's love and compassion, his grace to flow through me and out to someone else? Put my own agenda aside. And so I leave you with this simple story, which is insignificant. It's as insignificant as the story I started with. To remind us that grace in any form, at any time, in any circumstance, is powerful. When we understand the grace we live under because of Jesus, the King who came to serve, who saved us from God's wrath and granted us access to his kingdom, we should be willing to be willing conduits of his grace every day day. His grace, his humility, and his compassion on display in us should be evident to the world in the way we serve him and them every day. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we just ask that you help each one of us understand and admit the things in our lives that we are allowing to block the pathways to our receiving and our extending grace, to serving you and the world in your grace. We just ask you prompt us to take steps to discover what it means individually for each of us to unleash your grace in our lives. We pray this in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen.